wanted to talk about um, learning and training in the uh, setting where the data or the processor is quantum. And uh, uh, in the first part of the talk, I'm probably going to discuss some of the basic concepts in quantum, and then I will slowly go toward the quantum learning problems. So let's uh, start with a brief uh, history of quantum computing. Well, uh, in 1980s, uh, we had the early suggestions of quantum computing by uh, Manning, Feynman, and Benioff. Later on, uh, we had more concrete early models of quantum computing and the first generations of quantum algorithms. Notably, we had the Dushchev's algorithm, Shor's algorithm, Grover search, and many other algorithms. Later on, uh, almost a decade after, uh, we had the first two qubit quantum computer. And uh, it was later until 2001, where we had one demonstration of Shor's algorithm on a seven qubit quantum computer for factoring number 50. Since then, there have been a lot of investment and uh, uh, significant attentions from researchers to expand uh, our technology and to uh, find new algorithms and new theories. Uh, notably, uh, very recently in 2021, IBM announced uh, uh, a, a, a quantum processor chip going beyond 100 qubit. And uh, it was expected to go beyond 1,000 qubit. And uh, lastly, uh, uh, we, we plan to reach a fa fully fault-tolerant quantum computers. So um, as you know, right now we are in a near-term era, and uh, which means that the uh, the process and the qubits they are not noiseless. There, there we have always noise, and uh, uh, we have so far uh, the record. I think so far is four hundred thirty-three qubit, but again, these are uh, qubits with infidelity. So here is the map of um, recent uh, developments in quantum computing. Uh, it covers uh, techniques both from hardware perspective and uh, algorithmic and design perspective. Um, there are many prototypes and uh, leading architecture for quantum computing. Uh, for instance, we have the superconducting quantum computers, the, uh, the photonic-based quantum computing, uh, the ion-based ion uh, quantum computing. And uh, in the software level, we have a lot of startups uh, working on designing uh, compilers, designing program languages. So this is a, uh, there are so many efforts in this area to uh, advance our knowledge of quantum. So what is a quantum computer? Well, uh, in a very simple term, um, quantum computer, essentially the gate-based model for quantum computing is something like this. We have a series of inputs, which are qubits, and there are going to be a series of uh, operations uh, called quantum gate operation. This is very similar to the uh, logic-based uh, classical computing, where we have a series of uh, classical logics applied to um, uh, input bits. But now, uh, in a quantum computer, the input is usually qubit. But the output is, uh, most of the time, the output is classical. So which means that at the last layer, we apply a series of measurements to uh, drive our classical answer. And I will explain why. Uh, because of the stochasticity of the measurements, now each time, even if we fix the input, the output is going to be random, and therefore, um, unlike classical, well, usually a, a classical algorithm produce the answer deterministically. In quantum, a quantum algorithm generates a probability of possible outcomes. And uh, we want the algorithm to uh, 
concentrate most of the math of the probability around the true answer. That's why we usually in quantum computing, we run the quantum algorithm multiple times in order to boost the true answer. But why quantum computing is necessary? Uh, there are several um, approaches and advantages of using quantum computing. One is to um, speed up classical problems. Uh, notably, we had uh, Shor's factoring algorithm. It is suspected to be an NP problem. And uh, currently, the best known classical algorithm runs exponentially in the number of bits. However, Shor's algorithm, it's shown that it's going to be polynomial in the number of bits. So it's a BQP complexity class. And uh, on, the, on the figure on the right, as you can see, it's a comparison that how the exponential speed up will take effect when we increase the number of digits. So this is going to have uh, significant consequences in the future. Uh, for instance, many of the encryption uh, algorithms are based on fact integer factoring. If we can do integer factoring in polynomial time, then there's a risk that we would be able to uh, break those uh, encryptions. There are also other problems, such as Simon's problem, uh, which we get exponential speed up, um, uh, Berestein, Vazirani, Dwesh and uh, another, another uh, speed up is considered polynomial speed up, which is the Grover search algorithm, where we get quadratic speed up compared to classical search. So there are several of these attempts to speed up classical computations. Another advantage of quantum computing is leveraging the quantum data itself. What does it mean? It means that imagine a scenario where, first of all, nature is quantum. So now imagine a scenario that we were able to harness data without any measurement from the nature. There, and with the quantum computers, now we can directly operate on the quantum state of physical systems. And this is uh, appearing in optical systems, in sensors with uh, quantum effects. Now we have more and more recent developments in this line. This is, a, uh, now this is a kind of uh, information which is not accessible to classical computers. So there isn't, there's not even a competition. And it is kind of uh, natural because um, we know nature is quantum and now we, with quantum computers, we can harness those quantum uh, effects in nature. Another, uh, so with, with this, by leveraging this quantum data now, another effect we can use is we can simulate quantum physical processes. And this is something that some companies such as Microsoft Research are pursuing. And the idea is that, well, each time uh, we add another state to the system, the dimension doubles or dimension grows exponentially. So this we can simulate things in classical, but uh, since the dimension growing exponentially, at some point, this, should, this will be hard for classical computers to perform any simulation of large, cube, large uh, molecules. So um, therefore we have a set of problems with quantum computers that are not even accessible to classical computers. And this has a wide range of applications, including simulations in chemistry, drug discovery, uh, the quantum many body systems, photonic circuits, and even social sciences. This is a third approach now. Now, another advantage is to use um, enhanced learning models, to use quantum mechanical resources, such as entanglement, to enhance uh, our learning capabilities. 
or learning models. And the idea is that, so the data here could be classical or quantum, but the processor is going to be quantum. And because of the entanglement and because of the exponential uh, state space, the processor or the quantum model uh, can explore things that classical computers cannot do. All right, but there are several challenges in the road ahead. And uh, many of these challenges are at the hardware level. For instance, we have qubit decoherence, the amount of the time that the qubit takes to interact with the environment so far is very low. We would like to uh, isolate the qubits from the environment so they stay cohere for a long time. And uh, this has to be larger than all the gate operations we need. So far, we have very little time. After some point, the qubit starts, starts uh, losing its uh, properties. Another challenge to address is infidelity. It means that now we are in the NISC era and the quantum operations are noisy and um, we would like to resolve that by uh, several methods which I'm going to explain in the next slide. Another challenge is scalability. So the number of qubits that the processor can take so far is, is low. And uh, the last challenge to address is the speed. We would like to increase the number of operations per second. And uh, there are approaches for addressing this. Some of them are at the hardware level. We would like to have a better hardware. And another kind of approach is to apply error correcting codes. So in this way, uh, we combine several qubits and then we apply error correcting code to make them into one uh, neat logical qubit. And the third approach is to resolve this at algorithmic level. And this is something that recently been studied. The idea is that uh, for some applications, uh, we don't need a fully fault tolerant quantum computer. We can handle these, so these uh, infidelities and uh, these errors as an extra sources of randomness and we can handle them at algorithmic level. So now, um, with this current, with this uh, brief introduction, now I'm going to focus more on the learning side. And if time permits, I'll go toward the uh, band-limited quantum neural network. But uh, first, I'm gonna uh, just introduce some of the basic notions of uh, quantum computing. Maybe it's a good time for me to pause for a little bit in case if there's any question. Okay, so, all right. So let's, let me explain a little bit of the basics of quantum. Um, so quantum or basically quantum mechanic is built based on four postulates and uh, I'm gonna explain three of them today. So the first postulate is about quantum states. Now in classical, we know that Classical bits belong to either um, zero or one, they are very deterministic, or they could be random, but they're either zero or one. And uh, we can easily manipulate them, we can copy them. But in quantum, we have qubits. And qubits live in Hilbert space of dimension two, which is essentially the uh, vector space of comp with complex components. In qubits, they live as a superposition of zero and one. So you, I think most of you have seen this um, expression. This doesn't mean that the state is randomly either zero or one. It's something different. It's in a superposition of the two. And um, another effect that qubits have is that each time we add a qubit, 
the dimension doubles. So for d qubit, uh, the space is going to look like this, C capital D, where D is exponential in the number of the number of qubits. And a specific uh, property that they have is that we cannot clone unknown qubits. So that's kind of a deviation from classical. And by the way, pause me anytime if you have any question. So, um, but we have, these are qubits, so we can have more general quantum states in nature, and we can talk about uh, more general quantum systems. And, uh, but for this talk, let's assume we're talking about qubits only. And uh, so more specifically now, how do we represent a qubit? We represent it by two complex numbers that uh, norm their norm is equal to one. So absolute value of alpha square plus absolute value of beta square is one. And um, there is this famous uh, Dirac's notation where we can um, denote a qubit as these vectors using this notion, this uh, uh, brackets notion. And now when we talk about a superposition state, it is going to be something like this. And if you think about it, so these are, so we have two complex numbers, each of them have two components, two elements. So we have four parameters, right? But for representing quantum states, because the norm is one, and um, because of this property, then we can represent a, a quantum states as, as a vector in the block sphere, which is of two dimension. Uh, so the sphere is in 3D dimension, but uh, in order to represent a vector, you just need two numbers here. Okay. Is that clear? Any question? Okay. That was postulate one. Postulate two states that um, how a quantum state evolves. So, so, so how a quantum system evolves. This could be a quantum computer, for instance. And we can have, we're talking about an isolated quantum system. So imagine a quantum computer isolated from the rest of the world. And uh, this system, uh, similar to other quantum mechanical systems, uh, evolves based on some restriction and some laws. And the second postulate of quantum mechanics says that the evolution should be carried out by a unitary transformation. Meaning that if we are at a state uh, psi t1 at time t1, and uh, if you are looking at the state of the system at time t2, then uh, the two states are related via a unitary transformation. And this is known as the Schrodinger's equation. So what are the unitary transformations? They're, based, they're essentially matrices that look like this. And Hadamard is an example of that. So one property of unitary is that the operations are going to be reversible. And this is uh, the backbone of quantum computing, meaning that now because of these properties, now each gate into, in a quantum computer should be reversible. And this is something which is different from classical, right? Because in classical, we can have the logical AND function. It's not reversible. If we look at the output of the AND, we cannot recover the inputs, right? But in quantum, we cannot use something like that. It has to be uh, reversible. So uh, it, it could be a gate like this. So on the left, we have uh, this C0 gate, which is uh, equivalent to this logical gate in classical. Okay. So all the gates should be reversible in quantum. Okay. Now, postulate three, and the last postulate in this talk, um, addresses 
quantum measurement. So recall that at the last layer of quantum computer, there was a quantum measurement. And quantum measurement essentially are the interaction of us on quantum systems. So we can measure things, measure certain properties of a quantum system. And the way we model a quantum measurement is an operation which applies on a quantum system and outputs a classical answer. So here is an example. So here, let's say we have a qubit in this superposition and we measure it along the computational basis. Then the result is going to be a classical bit where the probabilities are a square of the coefficients in alphas. So again, Superposition is different from probability. But when your state is in superposition and you measure it, the output depends on superposition coefficients. Okay? But one thing that quantum measurements they do is that they uh, collapse the quantum states. And they are also probabilistic. So the, these are two very important uh, differences between quantum and classical. And that is when we have our samples, when we have our processes, everything is reversible until we perform a measurement. When we perform a measurement, we completely destroy uh, the quantum states. So, and the quantum state is now gone. Um, we cannot reverse it. And uh, we can only use the classical outcome we got. On top of that, the classical outcome is going to be random. Even though if you fix the input, the outcome is going to be random. And that's the reason usually quantum algorithms uh, should be run for several times. So we get the correct answer most of the time. Okay. And exactly, that's, that's how a quantum measurement will look like at the end layer of uh, a quantum computer, right? So, but these things I mentioned, they're going to have massive consequences. So I listed some of the consequences here. Now, on top of these uh, collapse of quantum states and stochasticity of quantum measurement I talked about and no cloning of quantum states that I talked about, there is another property, which is the consequences of these postulates, and that is the uncertainty principle. I think you, most of you have heard about the Schrodinger's cat, for instance. Um, what, does, what it says is that there are certain properties that we cannot measure them simultaneously. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, for instance, the position and momentum of an electron are cannot be measured simultaneously. What does it mean? It basically means that if I increase the accuracy for measuring the position, then uh, the best accuracy I could get for measuring the momentum will drop. And it's a theoretical limit. It doesn't, ma it doesn't matter how uh, sophisticated my measurement device is. It's a theoretical limit. And this is... This is not just something appearing in physics, it also appears in, in quantum computing. And that is specifically in quantum learning. Now, imagine now as, as a usual uh, learning scenario, we have a training set, and then we try to um, measure the training loss, compute the gradient, and update the quantum system, right? As, as we do in the classical. If we wanted to do it that way, then our certainty principle will kick in. And what is the consequence? The consequence is that, first of all, we can choose to measure the training loss or gradient, not both. They're not compatible with each other. On top of that, even the components of the gradient, right? The gradient is a vector of the derivatives, right? Even the component, each of these derivatives, uh, the way we can calculate, compute them is using quantum measurements because the system is quantum and the loss is classical, right? 
So even these components, some of them might not be simultaneously measurable. And that's going to have a massive consequences in learning applications. And I will talk about this part a little bit further uh, during the talk. Um, but this was my brief introduction of quantum. So is there any question? Okay, so now I'm gonna move toward the um, learning part of this quantum computing. So, so far we talked about basics of quantum, right? Now let's talk about machine learning applications. Uh, in general, if you want to compare classical and quantum, we have a figure like this. In classical, essentially, we have the algorithms and we have the classical data, which are in bits, and we perform the training. We try to train a model and, uh, and it, it could be in different, different applications, right? In quantum, though, um, we have a quantum processor and uh, the input to that processor is qubits. And these qubits, can come directly from some quantum state, or they could be originally classical and we embed them into qubits. But in any way, the input to this quantum processor is a quantum state, and it's in a superposition of states and all of that. And here we want to train this system in order to perform a pattern recognition or classification or whatever the application is, right? So now based on that, we can talk about uh, different types of learning, depending whether the data is classical or quantum or the algorithm or processor is classical or quantum. So at one level, we have the CC, the usual classical, everything classical learning, we can have a CQ, which means that data is classical, algorithm is quantum. We can have a QQ, data is quantum, and algorithm is quantum. We can also have quantum data, classical algorithm, but this is usually will turn into a classical, classical algorithm. Okay. Now, let me, let me summarize what are the differences between a quantum learning model and a classical learning model. So first of all, based on the postulates I mentioned, uh, the first consequence is that we cannot clone the training samples. Uh, second of all, when we measure, it destroys the samples and we have uncertainty, right? the gradient and training loss cannot be measured simultaneously. On top of that, we have stochasticity. It means that the training loss is going to be random now. Now we want to optimize a random function. Um, this is not necessarily a challenge. It could be something that we can use it because this uh, natural source of randomness can be used to escape local minima, for instance. And we'll see how to use it. Um, as resources, we have entanglement. I didn't talk about entanglement, so it's a bit more complicated. And it's a very powerful pattern, a very powerful resource to find more and more patterns. We have also exponential space because adding more qubits uh, increases dimension exponentially. And this is very important because now in quantum we have exponentially reachable models. For instance, with three, 300 qubit, we get the dimension to be two power 300, which is more than the number of atoms in the universe. On top of that, we also have access to naturally quantum data, uh, which wasn't accessible at all to classical. 
So having this summarization, let's look at the optimization and training in a closer loop. Now, in these settings, typically in optimization or training, what we have is a hybrid classical quantum loop. So here we have a quantum circuit and it has a set of parameters. The parameters could be the rotation, could be the parameters of the gates, could be the um, parameters of a detecting device. Um, but in all of these scenarios, the parameters are classical and now we have a quantum computer or quantum device to train or to optimize. So the optimization is done by a classical program. Usually it's done by a classical program and we try to train this. And it has several applications, dynamical simulations in machine learning, in combinatorial optimization and many other. And uh, this quantum classical hybrid loop is usually uh, iterative and a typical application a typical way of doing it is by a stochastic gradient descent. And there are several works in this line. And let me give you another example of that. It's uh, neural networks. So in classical, we have neural networks uh, with activation functions and the weights that we can optimize. Now in quantum, a neural network would look like something like this, where we have now, instead of each node, now we have a small circuit and uh, the circuits are now connected to each other, like the way the nodes are connected to each other here. And they are parameterized. So instead of putting weights on the edges here, now the weights are inside these circuits. They kind of determine how to, how, so we are training these small, perceptrons and they connect to each other and they make a larger and more complicated uh, neural network. And again, one small difference is that the input is qubit, but the output at the last layer of the network, there is a measurement which uh, takes a decision for us. Okay. And there are several works here and uh, generally, the, the idea of quantum perceptron was developed uh, during the 90s. Uh, these are the early uh, notions of quantum perceptron. And now, so far, we have a lot of work, significant amount of work in this area. Okay. Now, let's go back to the training part. Let's look at it even more in more depth. Now, I talked about uh, a quantum classical loop, right? And uh, so now in general, th this device, this quantum circuit, which could be a quantum neural network, it could be a, any device. Uh, at the end of the day, it's a unitary operator with some parameters. Unitary because of the second postulate. Every process has to be unitary. And, at, and it comes up, it comes with a measurement. And now we have the input state and now we have the prediction, right? Or the current loss, right? And usually the measurement is fixed and we only concern about uh, the quantum operator in the middle. And uh, typically we have a set of training samples, right? Uh, training samples could be a set of qubits with some labels, right? And we can assume that they are generated randomly. And uh, each of the state could be a packet of d qubit. So the dimension is 2 power d. And the uh, yi usually is the true outcome, right? Now, if we, if we input each of these qubits into this system, it produces a prediction, which is y hat, right? And this y hat is generated based on this probability. Again, I, I talked about the stochasticity of quantum measurements, right? So this is the uh, formula that governs the probability. 
And uh, it depends, if you look at it, it depends on three things. Uh, the, the state, the input state, the processor, this unitary operator, which depends on parameter A, and the measurement process, the measurement uh, model. So usually the measurement is on the computational basis. Now, this process gives us Y hat. Now we can compare Y and Y hat using our choice of a loss function. And now with that, we can talk about expected loss and then we can talk about the train, right? We want to minimize this expected loss. And this could be this loss could be the zero one loss. Now we can talk about misclassification probability, for instance. And one of the method I mentioned is the gradient base. So gradient base are usually uh, very powerful for convex optimization. And they are essentially done using this update rule. So each time we compute the gradient and we try to push the system toward the gradient, right? Toward the negative of the gradient. Now, how does a gradient descent will look like in quantum? Well, in quantum now, we have this UA and A is a set of parameters, right? Is a vector of parameters. And recall that this was the loss function, right? Now, you might say that, we might say that, okay, the update rule would be something like this, right? Uh, some constant times the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters, states, and everything. But here, here's the issue. The first issue is that, unlike classical, we cannot even see the samples. Because if we see them, which means that we are measuring them, so they collapse. On top of that, we have a stochasticity of measurements. We cannot even compute this all together, right? But so that's that brings up the question that how do we even do gradient descent when we can't even look at the samples and we can't even compute the gradients because the uncertainty will principle will kick in. So that's a question. Now, um, before answering the question, let's look at the derivative of the loss. Let's make a closer look at that. How does it look like? Let's see. So usually um, a unitary operator is something that can be expressed with this operation, right? We can write any unitary operator as a power of exponential exponentiation, right? But now more, my parameters are parameters here. Now, and this was the expected loss. If we take the derivative, if we do calculations, use the linear, linearity of derivation, and uh, with, with some calculations, at the end of the day, we reach a, a expression that will look like this. Now here, this is what? This is a trace, which means that this is a probability of something and that something depends on the quantum state and the quantum processor. And this is this is uh, an asymmetric expression, right? And which is kind of not very natural in quantum, so it's kind of hard to measure it. Now, uh, now based on that. Um, the prior work on this in, two, in 2018 by Fanny et al. The idea there was to just simply make several copies of each sample. Let's make several copies and let's uh, measure each component of the gradient. And we have, we need a lot of that, right? We need a lot of uh, gradient expression and a lot of copies. So uh, we, perform that and we get these copies. Uh, so how many copies do we need? Again, recall that for each component of the gradient, we need fresh copies because of uncertainty. So that, that takes us a lot of samples and a lot of copies, right? But the question is, can we do better? And uh, the answer 
which was came out recently from my group was that uh, we can do uh, the gradient based update without any need for making copies. And this is something called the one shot uh, gradient update. And uh, so I won't explain it in details, but the gist of the idea is something like this, is that instead of trying to copying and approximating the gradient, I'm gonna, we're gonna create a device, a create an additional circuit, I call it VS, such that it gives, it measures the gradient randomly for me. And by measuring it, I mean that it gives me a vector, which one component of the vector is the derivative of one of the gradients. So I'm updating the system by not looking at, by not approximating the gradient, but by just measuring something that is, that is not even close to the gradient, but it is unbiased. Meaning that statistically, if I happen to do that multiple times, it would give me an approximation of the gradient, but I'm not doing that. I'm, do, I'm doing a one shot. For one sample, just one vector of, one random vector basically. And then we can show that. Now, if we, instead of approximating the gradient, if we put that vector into the gradient update rule, the system will eventually uh, converges to the local minimum. So the picture might look like something like this. So uh, the red arrows are the gradient, right? So there is supposed to be a red line. So this is the way we should go. But now with the one-shot approach, I go, uh, I, I move like a random moves up like this even horizontal or vertical, horizontal or vertical, like that, right? And then we can show that with this approach, the system converges to the local minimum, and this is a convergence rate. Now, if you want to compare, uh, this is called the randomized quantum stochastic gradient descent. Let's say if we, so this is important because uh, with quantum data, usually we, we cannot even clone the quantum data. So we cannot even use the approximation methods. But let's say even if we do, how do we compare? Well, uh, with randomized quantum gradient descent, if we fix the number of copies and samples, let's say M, then the excess loss would be something like this. But with these approximation methods, it would be something like this. Uh, which means that as long as log C by C is order of epsilon square, epsilon is very small, which means that C is um, not too large, then we, no, then we get even a faster convergence rate. So um, now let me show a few numerical results just in case. So this is one of the known, the known uh, data sets in this area where we try to distinguish between two types of quantum states, the pure, pure quantum state and mixed quantum states. They are given like this. And um, here, this device is a parametric, you know, unitary operator. If you take that and if you apply this randomized quantum stochastic gradient descent, then the training loss is something like this. And the red part is the average, and the blue parts are the, the points, right? And again, it's random, right? That's why you see this, this uh, deviation, right, from the average. But consistently, the average is dropping and they're converging to the black curve, and the black curve is a theoretical lower bound. And if you compute the um, uh, 
uh, gradient descent or it compute the gradient uh, or accuracy of the system, it will be something like this, 91% for this approach and uh, compared to the 93%, so something like that. Okay, so let me give another example. Um, here, uh, the, the problem is we want to detect whether a quantum state is entangled or not, right? And we don't have any information about quantum state. Uh, it's completely agnostic. We are just given a, a set of samples, a set of quantum states, with the label being zero or one, that's it. Now, um, and each time now with the uh, one half probability, the state is either entangled, maximally entangled, or it is separable, right? Uh, so we use the uh, quantum neural network like this. It contains only three nodes and uh, and each node, each perceptron takes only two qubits. So, and each state is also a packet of two qubits. So I'm just gonna add another two auxiliary qubit to ancilla qubit. I'm gonna train this. And here's the training notes, which will look like something like this. And again, here, uh, the validation accuracy would be very close to the optimal accuracy. So this was also another numerical mm -hmm. result. Okay, so I think, uh, how, much, how much more time do I have? I think maybe it's a good idea to finish here. Um, yes, I think uh, it's around 10 minutes. Uh, 10 minutes, okay. Mm -hmm. um, are there any questions? Maybe it's a good idea for me to pause. For a little bit, so to see if there's any questions here. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I actually have a question for the, the previous uh, slides. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, for the gradient commutation part, this so part actually, this uh, is more... I think several slides uh, oh, okay. before. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, I think uh, you, you must know the, the parameter shift rule to compute the gradients. Yeah. So uh, just wondering what is the advantage of using the proposed method? Is the number of um, uh, circuit executions is, uh, is uh, sm much smaller than the parameter shift? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. That plus the fact that we, you don't need to copy because uh, mm -hmm. with that method, um, that method, you, your goal is to um, approximate the gradient, and that that's a way. That's a that's a point where this uh, this method is deviated from this older older methods, right? You don't mm -hmm. you don't try to approximate the gradient here. You try mm -hmm. to um, measure the gradient very loosely, mm -hmm. as long as you show that uh, it is an unbiased estimation. The convergence mm -hmm. will appear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Any more question? Okay, so if there is no more question, I will briefly touch up on this idea of band-limited quantum neural networks. Um, so um, I I talked about quantum neural network and training of them, right? Uh, but there are there are some fund foundational issues needs to be addressed in quantum neural networks. And 
uh, one of the well-known issue is called barren plateau issue. It's basically saying that the dimension is so big that if if we randomly initialize a quantum neural network with some structure, if we don't try to initialize it properly, then after some time, uh, when during the training, the gradient will vanish everywhere. We won't get any signal from the gradient to update it. And uh, one reason is because the, um, the dimension is so big, it's exponentially big, and then we get very loose signal from everywhere. So in this work, we try to kind of tackle that by limiting the structure, by giving a, a structure to a neural network, to a quantum neural network. It's based on this notion of bandwidth. And uh, bandwidth uh, is not the usual bandwidth, like bandwidth of signals, but it's something related to that. It is something studied in classical learning, and it's based on the Fourier expansion of Boolean functions. It's a Boolean Fourier, and it's studied extensively in computational learning. And uh, now and recently, it's been studied in the context of machine learning as well. What is a Boolean Fourier expansion? Well, um, the Boolean Fourier expansion says that if you take any Boolean function, it doesn't have to be even Boolean. It's just that the input has to be Boolean. And now here for uh, representation purposes, instead of the usual zero one, I'm using plus one and minus one. So minus one instead of zero. So imagine this function G and now, the Boolean Fourier says that you can write this function in this form. You can decompose it in this form. But this S is, it is summation ranges over all subsets of D because of we have D inputs, right? The GSS are the Fourier coefficients. They are calculated this way. And the KISS are just monomials. So if I give you a subset S, you just uh, multiply xj where j belongs to s. That's it. And here's an example. For instance, you can write the logical OR function in its Fourier expansion. So the Fourier expansion is like this. And you can, if you put plus or minus ones on the right, you can check that it satisfies the truth table for logical OR function. And now here, with this Fourier, we can talk about bandwidth. So the idea is that you just fix a, fix a K and look at all S's that are having K elements. And then a square the Fourier coefficient, it gives you a number, this WK. And if you draw WK as a function of K, it gives you a power spectrum. It just basically tells you how much of a power is on um, single variable elements to two variable elements, to three variable elements, up to d variable elements, right? It gives you a notion of band. And how, do, how does it compare with the classical Fourier transform? Where in classical Fourier transform, the idea was that we had this duality. If you have a pulse, the longer the pulse is in time, the narrower the bandwidth would be in frequency. We have a similar scenario. Here, uh, the less complicated your function is, uh, so if it is x1, then the narrower the bandwidth would be. And uh, the higher the bandwidth, it means that your function is influenced by a larger number of uh, components. It's more complicated. So it is studied in machine learning as well, a probabilistic version of that. I'm not gonna explain it. But in quantum, um, now we have classical Fourier transform, right? And we had Boolean Fourier transform classical. Now in quantum, we have quantum Fourier transform. This is the one, if you look at the Shor's algorithm, this is the one that will appear there. But here, this quantum Fourier transform is 
is essentially quantum version of classical one. But do we have something that is in the Boolean cube, but in quantum? Well, this is based on, the answer is yes, and this is based on Pauli operators. And they're essentially, now, instead of function, if I take any operator, I can decompose it into Pauli operators. And with the coefficients are now Pauli coefficients. And now I can talk about bandwidths there. So therefore I have a complete picture here, right? Now I can now talk about quantum neural network with bandwidth. Now I can say, I'm gonna um, limit the bandwidth of each quantum perceptron in the neural network. And I can play with that parameter. I can change the bandwidth as lower, larger, slower, larger. And uh, I get different, different neural networks, right? And for example, let me finish, I think, with this slide that the neural network I explained was at the beginning of the numerical results, was, was actually a narrow bandwidth quantum neural network where the, where the bandwidth was just two. And um, that helps to train the neural network because you have fewer number of parameters. You can also control the parameters. You can say, I wanted to use a wider bandwidth, let's say in the beginning or narrower bandwidth in the middle, or you can change it however you want based on the design. And that gives, it gives us the flexibility to design this quantum neural network. And this was the uh, numerical result. I think with that, I, uh, I finish my presentation. Thank you so much.